All right, the next one is goal setting. Helping kids learn to be good goal setters. They set good, they, set, they, they learn how to set academic and non-academic goals. They learn how to prioritize those. They know when something is realistic. They develop plans. They understand short-term and long-term opportunities. They find ways to reach goals even when faced with obstacles. And they work with others to reach goals. You see how these start to tie together? I, there's a wonderful quote I love. Um, and it's, it's the idea that, um, that uh, the ability to persevere when faced with conditions beyond comprehension. Now, I, I, um, I want to tell you how important goals are. Uh, I'm, I'm an outdoor adventure explorer. I, I facilitate a program that, that uses outdoor adventure as, as our modality. And the most famous program that does that kind of work is what? Knowles. Knowles. And the other one is Outward Bound. Outward Bound. Okay? And Outward Bound was created as a concept because seamen, British seamen, when, uh, when they were, when they were you know, shipwrecked or, or, you know, or, or their boat was sank, they would die. The young British soldiers would just die, and the old grizzled veterans would live. Well, why? Why did the young ones not have that strength of will, and the older ones, you know, did? Because when you begin fatalistic thinking, and you think, I, I can't accomplish it, I, it's, this is just too much, then your will to live, your will to, to accomplish, just withers. But when you start looking at, okay, what's the first thing I need to do? And you start looking at setting little tiny objectives along the way, that's what pushes and drives you forward in a capacity that allows you to take on the world. You do it in your daily lives. If, you're, if, if you have a day where you've got no responsibilities whatsoever, and then you just lounge around all day, how satisfying is that day? It's a nothing day. But when you've got something to, to work towards, and you are focused and you are trying to accomplish a goal or objective, how does that end of that day, when you've made strides towards that, how does that day feel? That day matters. Because goals are critically important to us, and when we help kids learn how to set goals and objectives, really powerful things happen. I will tell you, we really struggle to keep the house together. Our house looks like, very often like a stuff bomb went off inside. And the only way that I have found to get my kids to, to, to clean up is together, before we start, we do a task list. All right, and then I said, little time goals. Okay, guys, 15 minutes and we re regroup. Who's gonna do this, this, and this? Ready, go. And we've set this tiny little goal and boom, everyone scatters off and gets their stuff done and we come back to, to do the next thing. Now my daughter is the exception to that rule. She will go to her location and then get stuck playing with a cat. <laughs> or, you know, my daughter requires something called the body double. Now, here's a little bonus, because I hadn't planned to talk about the body double. But the body double is, sometimes, to accomplish a goal, all we need is somebody in the room with us. And if we don't have that, we just sort of go where the wind takes us. <laughs> the body double. You don't have to be helping them with it, you just have to be in the room. So, talk about structuring environment for success, you know. We post-establish goals and review that progress. We recognize the power of outdoor adventure. Uh, we recognize the power of things that make us passionate. We create these islands of competence. We complete uh, a learning styles inventory. I think it's a that you ought to know. In math, am I better reading or listening? And uh, if I'm doing an assignment and I'm listening to a lecture, how do I need to take notes? What's the best way for me to keep and retain this information? How do we remove distractions? All right, a quick, quick little, quick little story. We got a, a, um, a friend of mine. His uh, his son was at school and got sat at lunch. And so he goes to have lunch. He ends up having sat lunch with his kid. And he goes to the teacher, and you know, he goes to the room. And he realizes she has put him up front. And the reason she has put him up front is because he's very distractible, and she can come over and you know just touch his shoulder a little bit and keep him kind of from being distracted. But what's the problem with him being up front? It's happening right now. I gotta see what's going on. If there's a pin that drops, I gotta figure out what's going on. What's happening behind me? Oh, I know there's good stuff happening back there. All right. So he suggests, well, maybe from moving to the back of the room instead, or or reconfigure your room so no one's in the front and no one's in the back. So now 
He goes, something happens, and all he has to do is what? Look up. Scan the room. See what's going on. The only place you don't want that kid is in front where he can't see people or next to the window. Because when the, when the car drives by, you're like, oh, that was, you know, that was just like the car we had last summer when we ran it when we ran at the airport. We went to Orlando. And, oh, I love Disney World. It was so much fun. And there's that ride where you, you're in, the, you're in the, 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 the water ride where you go down the chute. You know, she's trying to teach you math, you know, some sort of geometric equation, and you're in the Congo. And it just doesn't work. I am a big fan of uh, experiential education. You know, learning by doing. All right, so we're going to do that right now. Go ahead and stand up. All right, I'm going to teach you. Here's a little bonus. Bonus exercise. All right, <laughs> big fan of something called mindful movement. All right, so thinking and moving and just sort of getting out of your head. So here we go. We're going to try a quick one. Put your right hand down, and you are going to make it, and just wait till I give you final instructions. You're going to make an infinity sign. Okay? You, know, you all know the infinity sign, right? And as you start the infinity sign, you're going to breathe in until you get back to the center point, and then you're going to breathe out as you come back. And so, let's begin. Breathe in, and breathe out. Nice and slow. Breathe in, and breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Let's try the other hand. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. One more time. Breathe in, and breathe out. Come back to center, shake them out. We've just cleared our mind. And so having opportunities to do that can structure environments in a really healthy, positive way for success. Go ahead and sit down. I'm a big fan of developing organization strategies at work. My, uh, uh, my son, we tried, tried, tried to figure out a way to get him to organize his room. And so somebody, somebody else uses bins. So we held, we got some bins. We spent, you know, $100 on bins. And we put everything in the bins. And you know why that didn't work? Take a guess what would happen. Dump out the bin. He'd dump out the bin. I'm living it. You're living it. <laughs> you, know where, you know where our solution was? Clear bins. He can see what's in them. You know who came up with that idea? My son. So when you invest in help, helping them figure out ways that they can organize themselves, powerful things can happen. All right, now we're moving into the latter part of this workshop. You have just a few more minutes together. Support systems, all right? People who tend to have more success in adulthood, they know how to ask for help. Uh, they know when, it, when the help is necessary. They're willing to use every resource, technology and other, to accomplish that, that, that support. And they are aware of their rights. And when you've got a learning disability or ADHD, you have rights. You have rights under the ADA, you have, and as a child, you have rights under ICA. And the only way you can fight those barriers is you have to know. You have to know what your rights are. You have to know what you can ask for, and you have to know how to get it. And you have to know that, that, and that your school is required to provide you with an education that will prepare your child for whatever comes next. That is the law. And so knowing what those rights are is critical. And as, as these become young adults, knowing what my rights are is critical. Uh, I, I, just a quick word about um, uh, labeling. You know, the, there's only one reason why a label is something that matters. And that's as if it affords you the rights and services that you are required to have. Otherwise, it's just a word. All right, so support systems. Well, this is what they look like. Family, mentors, friends, and teachers. Which of these is the most important to kids? This one. Now, I, you know, again, we're running out of time, so this is a quick thing I want to say about this. Uh, friends, sorry. Yeah, teachers, not so much. Friends. Um, so my friends really mattered to me when I was a kid. They, they, they still do. But here's a, here's a real opportunity. Even though they might be emulating and doing the things that you would not want them to be doing and, and following the guidance and advice of friends, who did you turn into? Boy, I am my dad's son. 
I'm this, this magnificent blend of my dad and my mom, and so much of who I am as a parent really stems from the, 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 the things they did that I really liked, the positive, you know, I don't remember any, I can't remember a single piece of advice my friends gave me growing up that has created a sustainable change in my life. And even though this seems like the biggest part of the support network, the truth is that growing up, these are the people that you remember. And when you've got family that is there for you, willing to support you, but in essence, provide you with the, the, the structure necessary to be successful, and you've got mentors that, that recognize your, your, your passion and your gifts, and you've got teachers. I mean, don't we all remember the charismatic teacher that changed our life? And that's a support network. I'm a big fan of creating a positive culture of support and accountability, like I mentioned in, the, in my first portion of the workshop, creating an atmosphere of respect. You know, um, uh, always differentiating your love and caring for a child and your disapproval of a particular behavior. Uh, there's a, a story, of, I had a, a little boy who was mooning other kids. And, you know, the first time he did it, the, the boy, the other kids thought it was hysterical, but, you know, we had to kind of deal with it. But because it was that first time that he, you know, he felt like, you know, they like me, they really like me, he kept going back to that well. And eventually he just, it, it just happened too many times and I had to send him home. Um, he's sitting there waiting for his dad to arrive. And his dad walks in, and I kid you not, this, this is, you know, this is a 12-year-old boy, and his dad is like seven foot one. I mean, this giant bear of a man. And he's this big, rough looking. I mean, he looked like he could be in a WWE. And I mean, I felt terrible for this kid. I really did. Um, and the first words out of that dad's mouth were, I mean, he'd driven, he'd driven like six hours to come get his camp, kid from camp. Uh, and uh, the first words out of his mouth were, he got down on one knee and he said, have you got a hug for your old man? Mm -hmm. I was so relieved, you know and tears exchanged, and we went in my office and we talked about what he would need to do in order to be able to come back to camp the next summer. And he did, and he was very successful. But, but that's the key, isn't it? Never once did I think that my mom or my dad didn't love me, even though they were frustrated with some of my choices and actions. And I was not easy to raise. Um, ensure there is clarity when giving expectations. Because when you are not clear about what your expectations are, what will kids do? They are good at finding those loopholes, aren't they? Well, on, on page three of the contract under section 5A, it did not specify that I could not have... Yeah, you have to be clear. Um, catch kids doing things right. I had a kid once say, hey, Big John, you're my favorite counselor. And I said, really, Dave, why is that? He said, because you're the only one who ever catches me doing stuff right. Yeah. And Dave was tough to catch doing stuff right. I had to work on it. <laughs> I really did. I had to work on it. Um, uh, allow a child to maintain some level of control and create clear communication between homeschool and the people working. You really talk to each other. You know, make sure that you are communicating with the school. We've got a difficult teacher right now. We are really working hard to try and make sure those lines of communication are open and they understand our expectations and know that we can do whatever we can do to it, uh, make sure that what she wants to have accomplished is accomplished and that we're working with them, that we're part of a team, part of a solution. Because the minute that relationship with the school becomes adversarial, there's a wonderful quote. When elephants fight, only the grass gets trampled. Some strategies. Spend more time giving praise and correction. When talking with a child, get at or below eye level. All right, yeah, here's, a, here's a great example. I need another volunteer. Quick, somebody. All right, come on. Let's sit down right here. Okay. So, uh, if I'm talking to you in an angry tone and I'm above you like this, how does that feel? Does that feel very powerful right now? It doesn't, does it? All right, bless her heart, she didn't know what was coming. All right, no. You know, she isn't hearing a thing I'm saying. But if I get down, you know, at or below eye level and I say, hey, listen, what's going on? We can figure this out. How much different does this feel? Yeah, we're going to we're gonna we're gonna get this you know figured out, aren't we? All right, that go ahead. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause, shall we? <laughs> that, that's so important to remember because you can't get anywhere when I am talking at you. 
You've seen the look on your kids' faces when you do that. All right, avoid guerrilla arguing. All right, and this is what guerrilla arguing looks like. Um, uh, Jimmy, quit messing with Sally. I wasn't messing with Sally. Jimmy, I saw you messing with Sally. No, I wasn't. Yes, I did. I saw you messing with Sally. Well, did you see what she did to me? No, I just looked over and I saw you messing. Yeah, you didn't because you weren't looking at me. You, you're always focused on me. You didn't notice that she pushed me earlier in recess. You didn't notice that yesterday she tripped me. Where were you then? So, there, here we go. I, well, I, I, I didn't see what happened. I was focused on, and you're, you're sort of defending yourself, and now you are on trial and found lacking. There's a technique to resolve that. Jimmy, quit messing with Sally. I wasn't. Yeah, well, Jimmy, quit messing with Sally. Um, well, she pushed me. Jimmy, quit messing with Sally. Well, what about at recess yesterday? Jimmy, you're not in trouble. Quit messing with Sally. You say it over and over. You suck the energy out of it. And eventually, you're going to get this response. Fine. <laughs> because you've not given it any place to go. Um, be willing to disengage. Sometimes the battle is all that's important for kids. Just be willing to just disengage. Nothing positive is going to come from this. If you let kids reel you in, they are the fishermen, and then think of yourself, there's a hook in your mouth, and they're in control when you allow that to happen. Help children develop ways to express their anger or lash out. My son has a way to tell me, right now I'm furious with you and you suck right now. He has a way to tell me that without it you know, being, and it's something that we're working on. He's getting older. He's starting to have testosterone go through his body. He's getting to the point where he's, you know, he's punched the wall, but he hasn't put his fist through it yet. So we're working on trying to figure out how, how to help him get to that place where he says, you're not listening to me. And one of the things that we've recently done is when he feels like I'm being unfair and he starts to fight with me, I dig in. I mean, you know, I'm not perfect. I dig in. And so we worked out a way to kind of come up with the, my, my son says, can we negotiate? And that is a signal for me to move out of my unreasonable place and listen to what he has to say. And then we have a, you know, a healthy dialogue. So we, we figured out ways to communicate with each other that, uh, that, that help him express what he's thinking and feeling when he's angry. Because if he doesn't have those real ways to do that, what does he end up saying? I effing hate you! And that's not what he means, it's just him way of saying, I feel out of control. I don't feel like you're listening to me. God, you piss me off. Mm -hmm. But he can't use those words. Uh, use natural logical consequences. Uh, and and uh, again, quickly, we're running out of time here. But a natural consequence is you let your bike out. It rains. What happens to the chain? It rusts. You can't ride it. A logical consequence is you let your bike out. I had to bring it inside. What's the logical consequence? You can't ride it for a day, you know. Um, uh, punishment would be what? You're grounded. Well, what, how does that make sense? Here are some good examples. Um, oh. uh, put downs, they put three ups. Curses, come up with the alternative. Continue to annoy others, separate from the group. Displays unsafe behavior. Right here, buddy. You're right here, under my wing. Um, for table manners, you can eat by yourself if you're gonna, you know, play with your food, throw your food. We don't need to be around that. Finding ways, really clever, creative ways to have the the consequence fit the negative behavior that occurred. That takes really creative parenting, by the way. And 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 if you want to go that next step, when you're establishing consequences, have your kids come up with the consequences, and you then have veto power. And, you, and you, you have them do it until they come up with something where the, where the time fits the crime. All right, quick note on establishing consequences. Know what you can and can't control because when you establish a consequence that you really have no control over, you've lost. Um, consider establishing consequences in advance. That way, you know, if kids make a choice. And, and then your job is to make sure that the juice is not worth the squeeze, that the squeeze it's just a little, little too ouchy. All right, practice framing consequences in the positive. So rather than if you don't clean your room, you can't go to the movies, 
How do you frame that in the positive? If by, you know, hey, listen, if by 6.15 the room is clean, guess what? We'll go to the movies. Kids, you know what? Not just kids. All of us. All of us are much, much better at honey than we are vinegar. Never threaten a consequence you really know you're not going to follow through on. Talk about a lose. Um, you know, when... Uh, it just, I'm going to give you a, a little research. Um, rats. Uh, a bell would go off and they would get fed. A bell would go off, they would get fed. Eventually, the bell stops mattering. But if the bell goes off and sometimes they get fed, and a bell goes off and sometimes they don't get fed, when the bell goes off, you know, even, even rats will interact, uh, the, whatever the negative behavior you're looking for will react more co consistently to the, to the, the variant, to the, um, to the variable opportunity of sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, and it's the idea that maybe I'll get caught, maybe I won't. I'm going to play Consequence Yahtzee! <laughs> you know, that, that becomes a game. And you actually incur, uh, uh, encourage negative behavior if you are inconsistent with your consequencing. And if you don't follow through, you are in trouble, especially with strong-willed kids. Because strong-willed kids, you know what they think when, when you don't follow through on a consequence or you, or you show some kind of weakness? You know what they think to themselves? Oh, you're weak. I must crush you. <laughs> Ensure consequences keep their power. And one of the ways you do that is you don't take it away for too long a period of time. The effective administration of timeout. If you are interested in learning more about how to use timeout, I'll be happy to do that after the workshop. All right? But there's a whole system uh, with younger children about how to use timeout that may not pertain to all of you that, that I'm happy to share. And then I think I've mentioned being consistently consistent. Emotional coping. You're aware of how your emotions affect behavior. They recognize situations that cause stress. They use strategies to avoid or reduce stress. They recognize the onset of stress, and they know how to get outside support. So determine the systems that work, and then expand on those. Stop doing the things that don't work. Embrace kids' abilities. Help them find a way to voice their anger and frustration. And then don't, do, don't impose coping systems. Listen to what kids are telling you, and then do more of what they're doing. Remember at the very beginning of this workshop, I talked about kids uh, that, that, that taking what works and trying to expand it. As a parent, that is so much easier to do than saying, okay, we're going to try a whole new system now. And so, in closing, this is, this is my charge to you. Find ways to get your kids involved in the things that they care about. For me, and a lot of the kids that I serve, it's outdoor adventure. Pursue areas of interest for them. Find charismatic adults that you know are going to, to be a good part of your child's support team. Seek a goodness of fit. Figure out the things that they like to do and encourage those opportunities that will grow and nurture them. Use the summertime as an opportunity to grow. You know, it's a, long, it's a long, long summer. Think about it in a very proactive way. These are the things I'm going to do this summer that are going to nurture the goals and objectives that I establish. Look at volunteer opportunities. Uh, look at ways to get kids involved in things that matter to them. Because ultimately, this is what you're looking for. Right? That sense of, I can do it. I can accomplish anything. That young lady solved the puzzle. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.